Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Annie Talasto, and I'm CNCF Ambassador, and I will be your host tonight. So every week, we bring a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. They will build things, they will break things, uh, and they will answer all of your questions. So you can join us every Wednesday to watch live. This week, we have a really great session by Nigel uh, here with us to talk about detecting crypto jacking in Kubernetes workloads. And as always, this is an official live stream of the CNCF, and as such, it is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Play, basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants as well as presenters. But with that done, I'll hand it over to Nigel to kick off today's presentation. Cool. And uh, just to confirm, you can see everything that's on screen. There's no issues there with uh, the screen share. No, uh, I think no. now we see it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, thank you for everyone who joined today's session. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to work with Falco. So if I say kubectl get a um, we've got a, a simple two node Kubernetes cluster uh, right now. Um, and both those are EC2 instances running on yeah, AWS. So with this, it's not a complex environment. You can see we have a networking plugin, we have Falco. We also have a Falco sidekick, which you see on the right side pane, which is a, you know, for the purpose of the demonstration, it's a visual UI um, to demonstrate the alerts that are coming through in real time. So with that, I'm gonna kick off what we're gonna to try to do today, which is um, detecting crypto mining in, in Kubernetes. Now we're doing that with a tool called Falco. For those who aren't familiar with Falco, it's a um, runtime forensics tool and it can show you intrusion detection, any kind of unusual sign of security compromise um, in real time. Now, how we're doing that in today's session is we're going to achieve that via, um, via system calls that are already happening in Linux. So that applies to both containers because they're Linux and, and to the host, which are um, all Ubuntu instances in the case of my cluster. So with that, I'm just going to cover, first of all, what is happening here. So, you know, historically, what someone would have done is they would have, um, you know, pulled, you know, say from a, a GitHub repo, they pulled the um, the download fa package associated with Rig, which is a mining binary uh, for crypto mining. Um, with that, they would have, on this same Linux host, they would want to unpackage it, uh, once they've unpackaged the, the folder, they'd want a CD to that directory, which is the XM rig, whatever it is. And from there, they can then initiate crypto jacking. Now, this whole process is pretty straightforward. You know, I can, you can see here, this is one single command, and this is going to perform the crypto jacking, or the crypto mining, I should say, on the host, which I'm using the executable dot X or dot forward slash XM rig. Um, in that case, I'm pointing to a, a mining pool. Now, for the context of this demonstration, um, all kind of crypto miners, in order to share resources or pool resources, um, they connect to different mining pool IPs or domains and associated ports. In this case, it's um, the domain is XMR US East 1 location on bananapool.org, and the domain is 14433. Now, in order to authorize or authenticate to a wallet, you know, you can see you've got this um, hash value here. And also just for the purpose of my command, I'm silently using it using the background command. Now, once I run that, I'm crypto mining. So it's that, it's that simple. If you want to see what it looks like, you can say .xm rig. And this is what crypto mining looks like in, in reality. Now, that's pretty straightforward. You can see um, there's no errors. So I'm able to connect to that xm rig, whatever location and the port. So I want to close that process out for the second. And I want to explain, well, where is it becoming such a problem now um, for, so for the, the these environments? So we can um, CD out of that directory. We can remove the directory. Um, I'm even going to go ahead and remove the zip package that we just pulled. Um, now, the thing about crypto mining is it's so much more than just the host. You know, if I just kill that process there, um, you can run it as a container in Kubernetes. So I'm just going to kill that process. Um, that should be fine. Uh, that should be gone then. Um, so with that, um, yeah, you can run your crypto miner in this case as a Docker container. You can run as a pod in Kubernetes. Um, you know, since Kubernetes is highly scalable, it, it's an ideal target for crypto jacking. 
especially at the moment when we talk about the the cost of crypto jacking um, in different environment or crypto mining, um, the reward isn't really good for individuals. So you know, utilizing someone else's resources, compromising that environment, especially the scale of Kubernetes or the scale of an EC2 instance in AWS, you know, it, it's a broad target there, and we can take advantage of that. So to show how simple it is, or even easier it is to do crypto mining um, as a Docker image, you can see I just run this single command and that's it. So I'm saying sudo run as the um, administrative user. Um, I'm using the Docker run command, but I'm using dash dash rm. So essentially remove it after I run this interactive command. And the image in this case is metal3dxm rig. So it's the director of the folder um, you know, where it's hosted is metal3d, but the, the binary in this case is xm rig. So if I hit enter, you know, same thing again, you can run the crypto miner. Um, I might just give that, a, oh yeah. And you see in this case, the connection failed. So I went to any, you know, authorization. I didn't even generate the wallet associated with it. Um, it didn't authorize the connection. So we can just close that. And that's the end of the crypto mining is Docker. Now with the fact that you can run it in different environments, it means, well, first of all, how are we going to detect it? That's the whole point of today's session. So you can see on this right side pane, um, if I refresh the URL, um, you can see I got a bunch of detections. I actually forgot to turn off the or ena uh, enable the refresh. So at this moment, it's going to update every 10 seconds. So I have a bunch of rules I've configured in Falco to detect the indicators of compromise associated with crypto mining. Now, the first one that's pretty obvious is to detect outbound connections to common miner pools. So if I said um, kubectl get cm config map in the namespace, or yeah, it's going to be called Falco, it's named the config map, and it's in the namespace Falco. Now, oh yeah, that shows that it's there. So if I want to edit it, I can just show you quickly um, what the rule looks like. So if I run um, forward slash and I just want to look for, um, let's say miner or pool, I think is the best way. So you can see here what Falco can do is we configure a list. So a list is just um, like a, a list of things. So we have a list of ports, which we defined as the name miner ports. We have a list of domains, which are all the domains associated with crypto mining. And also, if I was to scroll down a bit, I can actually hit enter and go down through these. I've also defined, um, or you can do it as a um, IPs if you want to do it that way. You know, there's no limitation to how you define um, the different attributes that are going to define your rule. Now, I don't know if I've defined it below or I'm going to do it above. I think it's just above it. So we'll just scroll up a little higher. So yeah, you can create a macro that defines what is the conditions. The list is just a list of objects. And then we can create the rule, something like this, where you say, create hard link over sensitive files. So if I wanted to say forward slash, um, let's say common, I guess. Yeah, there's the name of our rule. So it's detect outbound connections to common minor pool ports. So in this case, we would say, there's a rule name. The description is what is it going to do for us? And then the condition is defining those macros and lists. So in, I have a macro called net miner pool. And the conditions of the met, net miner pool is saying it has to have these domains and it has these ports. If I define that condition, we've already proven that we can detect unusual network connection. Now, this second one here, we see the on the right side pane, I have this minor binary detected. This is not actually in the Falco rules. So if you want to actually see Falco rules today, you can go into the uh, Falco um, repository. You can go to the rules view. And from here, you can click on Falco rules. Here you then see all the default rules that exist, like the one we talked about there a second ago, um, like pool. You would see all of the list of items that are in it. But there's no um, default rules similar to this, where we see minor binary detected. So in that case, what I've done is I've actually created my own custom rule just before this session, where you can say, uh, maybe if I type in binary, you can see, yeah, minor binary detected. All I'm saying in this case is I want to detect malicious scripts or binaries detected in a pod or host, again, because it's all based on system calls. I can see it happen in the container. I can see it happen on the host. I can see it happen in Kubernetes, because we're relying on this uh, exec CVE system call. Now, as for what the output is, that's essentially what's going to show up in the uh, the you know the alert context. So, what you see as an administrator or an SRE is the output of the alert. So, you can put whatever context is relevant. In my case, I want to see, for instance, user ID. I want to see, you know, what was the node that it happened on. All of this relevant supporting context, even container name, so I understand 
where the incident occurred, when it occurred, so like timestamp, um, so I can then take further action on it. Now, what defines this minor binary detected? I basically said, you can see at the bottom here, list malicious binaries. So I made a very small list. It's only like six, I think, um, defined binaries. You can modify this whatever way you want. But I said, if I see an example of XM rig or nano mine or pawn rig or astro mine or whatever the miner is, you can constantly play around with this however you want. You define in the list, you can build a macro which says in malicious binary. So I say, if the process name contains any of these listed items, that's how our macro is defined. And then when I create the rule, I can say, you know, spawn process and it was listed as the macro in malicious binary. So there's this logic of rules embedded macros and in macros, there is the list items that support that. So now that we kind of understand the logic of how rules work, um, we can go a little further into triggering these different rules. Um, so yeah, with that, I said, you know, we can run it locally, crypto mining um, with XM rig. We could do it as a Docker image that we saw there a second ago, where we just run Docker run, and it's super simple to do this. And you can see the XM rig that was run there would have triggered under the minor binary detection. Now, things like the first thing I think is important to know is how can we prevent this from happening? So there's different, you know, initial access issues. So the first one is if you have a pod and it's given elevated permissions, let's say I run LS, I have the first pod here we're looking at is called security context YAML. In this case, in the pod definition file, you can say security context, and this is like what kind of permissions we're gonna give them. So we run user 2000 as the permission set, but also there's this allow privilege escalation and that's disabled because I guess as a, you know, as an admin, I don't really want you know, the pod to escalate permissions from there. The alternative, because you can say true, is if I was to cap the privileged pod, you can see this one has security context set to privilege true immediately. So essentially root permissions. Now, if I wanted to show you what this looks like in real time, we just have to say kubectl apply dash f on the uh, security context pod. When I do that, the pod is now created. If I wanted to shell into the pod, um, you can see then it'll open up the session. Now, you know, refreshing the URL, this in itself will trigger an alert. So I terminal shelled into a container. You know, unless you have a justifiable reason, why are end users shelling into the pods? Like, preferably, we don't want to drift from the original design that we deploy in our environment. So, yeah, again, you, there's legitimate reasons you might shell in for troubleshooting purposes. That would be the only real reason. Um, but for a, an adversary, they would do it for, you know, other reasons. So in that case, we've shelled into the pod. You know, if I was to, um, you know, go inside the pod, it works the same way as any other um, Linux host. You can run psox and you can see what are the commands or what permissions are set inside the environment. So if we try to do what we did earlier, where it's to manually install the crypto miner in a non-privileged pod, it would say something like this, permission denied. I'm unable to install the crypto miner in this environment. So with that, as the attacker, I'm kind of in a bit of trouble here. Now, if I was to say kubectl delete f the, I don't know what it was called, security context set to two, um, and create the other pod, which is kubel apply dash f privileged. So if I would create the privileged pod, you know, same logic applies here. The pod is now created. You can say kubectl get pods to see, you know, the pods are running. Um, hopefully it's running by now and I can just hit kubectl exec into that pod. And now you can see the difference between the first example and the second one is rather than running as a, you know, the standard user, I'm running as a root. So now that I'm running as a root, I can do, you know, the same command, except this time it will work, which is to, you know, curl, I'm pulling the package, I'm going to do exactly what I did on the, the main EC2 instance, which is, you know, um, unzip the package, which gives me the same directory, I can see the eggs and rig to that directory. And once I'm in there, you can see the files, which is the config file, the eggs and rig binary. So if I want to do crypto mining within that environment, uh, it's quite easy to, well, actually, I can even, you know, elevate permissions on a pod. So say something like ch mod, if I want to set um, group user ID um, or set git bit, sorry, on the on this um, executable. If I was to refresh the URL, again, you can see these different behaviors. 
So, so things like running chmod, um, any chmod, so drift from changes from the original design, you know, that will be flagged as changes in a file directory on a container the same way it would be on Kubernetes host. But all these other unusual behaviors, like if you looked at this holistically on the right side of the pane, there's someone's launched a privileged container, then they've terminal shelled into that container. If it was a real crypto jacking incident, they would probably just take an existing pod, executive pod, if it had the privilege set to true and do the damage from there. But in the case of like trying to do further escalation with the environment, yeah, they would want to create that privileged pod. If there's not, no, you know, so nothing in place to prevent them from creating that, and if there was no visibility, if there was no Falco, you wouldn't know that someone created a privileged pod. They were jumping into it, making all the file changes. You know, they called the pod some legitimate name, not like my one. You know, they might, yeah, they might call it like Redis database, something on those lines. So you want to be able to see examples of just unusual patterns of behaviors, like setting escalated permissions on the pod. So in this case, when they run the crypto mining, which is basically dot forward slash XM rig, you know, it works the same as it did in any other environment. If I was to refresh the URL, we should see the binary detected where we use the use of XM rig. Immediately, it tells us, you know, the command we just ran. So it gives us all that additional context. If I was uh, to there's refresh, there's a comment from the audience that uh, if we could make the CMD prompt a little bit bigger because they're having some trouble seeing that. Oh, of course. <laughs> no apologies. Does that look better or is that hopefully more visible? I think it's better, but it, we could maybe move it make it a bit more bigger as well if yeah possible. of course yeah it's my um unfortunately the screen is quite big <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it should be okay you should be able to see yeah. what's going on now so in this case you know we just showed that crypto mining works the same on the container as it does you know in on the host so if i was to exit out this container and we said kubectl delete dash f the privilege pod you know that has solved our problem for now but it's that knowing what is the dangerous pod. Like no one's going to call their pod privileged pod. Well, in this case, the name was actually test pod one, which is like, again, a bit sketchy from a visibility perspective. So what we want to do is maybe look at that example again, something about creating the privilege pod. Um, there's a few things you'd notice here is like if I was to, um, yeah, create a new privilege pod, this is something from scratch. Now, like people might, or sorry, adversaries might, uh, yeah, hit enter, cool. So we've created that uh, new, same definition file, actually, we're creating a brand new pod. Um, every time we do something like this, destroy a pod, create a new one, notice how like delete or rename shell history, like you just deleted all the associated data. So even like leaving a trail behind the attacker, every time they delete the pod, they created five minutes ago so that they don't get detected we get the detection, we see all of those events. So we stream them to, to Sista or through Falco, sorry. Um, so in this case, we would see delete or rename a shell history. So they, they don't hide um, detection. So in this case, if they wanted to um, shell into that same pod, which is the test pod one, they might want to, before they do the actual connecting to the minor ports, so on, they might want to put in some kind of suspicious networking tool to actually perform those actions. So one that they might want to use is something like Telnet or Nmap or whatever. You can define these tools yourself. Now, in my case, I tried installing Telnet. It told me, look, you can't because um, some issue with mirror list. Now, if I was to try and bypass that, so I moved into the you know, repo directory. And again, it's even this example of why is the attacker or why would anyone in our employee, in our company, shell into a pod, start using the YUM package manager to download things. They might be trying to download a tool that they need to use. But again, we should treat those as kind of suspicious behaviors. Like, why are you bringing something, an insecure tool like Telnet, into your environment? So this whole, like, making changes on a pod, um, then trying to run, for instance, YUM again, they would be able to do it, but we want to be able to trigger those detections. So we you know, we can refresh our URL, we can see like launch package management process in a container, again, unusual thing, or even just the process of updating the package manager. So when I ran yum update dash y, that in itself is suspicious. It's, there's obviously a spew of things happening from the package manager. So we see all those different alerts coming through. So again, it's just how you want to define these guardrails so that, I mean, of course, detecting the connections going out to the IP port or domain, 
Um, that's all great, but it's already happened. They've already compromised your environment. They're already um, wasting your resources. So what we want to do is be able to the signs of compromise before they happen. So in this case, if I wanted to install Telnet or any of these other networking tools, you would just run yum install Telnet. On our side, if we were to refresh this URL, it's just because I don't have the automatic refresh. And you see there, launch package management. Um, sorry, um, there should be, I think there are the suspicious tools. If I look up suspicious. Uh, oh yeah, there it is. So launching, I actually this one from earlier. Sorry, I'm still waiting on it. But earlier I did the same thing. I installed Telnet in on the container and yeah, it launched, uh, it, can, it effectively created the alert telling us that a suspicious network tool was created in the container. So what we want to do is, again, look at things like, you know, shell and terminal shell into the container, any file changes, you know, moving to the temp directory to, to evade detection, um, it did deleting historical changes they made, did deleting shell history. Um, these are all things that an adversary would want to do to evade detection so that you can't, as a incident or some bonds and forensics team, see what's going on. But because we are streaming all the events somewhere else, so even if the container is killed, we still see what happened within that environment. So in that case, even if I was to exit and say kubectl delete dash f the privileged pod and the pod is gone, we still see all of the actions as they happen. So we just have to refresh the URL and we see these examples of all the, again, delete or renaming of shell history. Now, the other thing that's worth pointing out is um, creating a crypto miner um, as a Kubernetes deployment. So if I was to say ls, um, we can see the miner deployment. So if I say cat miner deployment, you know, it's really straightforward. So you can, you know, as an example, create a deployment definition file. Um, you can call it miner. Again, if you don't want detection, you probably call it something different than miner. You would call it um, legitimate database. And then you would put it in the namespace of, you know, database name namespace. So in this case, what we're trying to clarify is whether you create it via, you know, your wget, you pull it and you um, re run chmod to turn it into an executable, or if you create it via deployment, we will still spot that image where it's pointing to, again, XM rig or to any of the other minor um, definition that we put in that list item earlier, um, which is really important. So in this case, if I want to say kubectl apply and create that pod, we can. Um, now, one other thing that's worth pointing out as well, um, and I may not have covered this already, but if I said QTTL get CM, and, and if there's any questions at this point about anything you've seen um, throughout the demo yeah. so far, just feel free to ask. Um, there was actually a audience question right now from Oliver. Um, would the hacker not be able to knock out the Falco container running in the same pod? They're assuming that that's how Falco does it, since it needs to be able to monitor process names and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Like that, that would be one of the things that they would try to do. Um, important to say there is like, um, you know, when you create, there's still the deployment file. Like if you set the, um, uh, what's the term where you um, only administrative privileges to make those changes in the first place, you know, only, you know, a, an elevated user would be able to make the changes on it. So even if they try, okay, killing the pod, it'll still get recreated as part of the deployment. That is true. That is one of the things that they would try to do. But of course, the pod is going to keep recreating. So there'll only be like short outages, I guess, and it'll make it nearly impossible for the attacker to continue that cycle of trying to evade detection as long as the events are still being streamed. But it is a good question. Great. Um, cool. So one thing I would say there as well is, um, oh yeah, we talked about this config map for Falco in the namespace Falco is not every, oh yeah, I should edit. Um, not every rule is going to be enabled by the default and there's good reason for that. So when we talked about the um, default rules, I think there was the set git bit. Um, yeah. So I have a rule here and if I hit enter, you can see it where it's set UID, set git bit true. Uh, in order for that to work, I did, of course, change the enabled to uh, true from its default setting, which was false. Now, it's really important to clarify here that there are some really interesting rules. There's, I think there's an example here for C2 servers. Yeah, so like you can create a rule, as you can see here, detects outbound connections to a C2 server. 
Uh, although it's, I believe, yeah, it's enabled by default. When you look at what is the definition, which is the list, the C2 server IP list, um, we can actually then look that up. So C2 underscore server IP list, and you can see that the item is actually set blank. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's for the end user to decide, you know, what is it I'm trying to block? Like if you wanted to say, um, we don't want outbound connections to a, a service like Tor, because again, um, an adversary might use Tor to um, keep the connections, you know, or they keep a bit of anonymity when it comes to um, speaking outbound from the environment. They don't want to be you to track where those connections are going. So what you could do is create an item list of all of the IPs associated with the Tor network. That doesn't change often. So again, it's not something that you need to be updating manually regularly. So you could certainly put that in the form of a list or create your own new list and call it something like Tor Relay. It's something I've tested before. Um, but ultimately the rules are really easy and customizable to say something on the lines of outbound connection to a C2 server. And from there you can, again, specify what is it we want to detect? More importantly, the output is what is it you're going to ship back home um, for further inspection? Um, the other thing as well is when we talk about moving through the environment into different um, areas, if I was to go quickly, because we're looking at this purely on system calls, but since we have a different, we have a plugin architecture where you can plug into different uh, tools or utilities. If I was to go to um, here, we have a GitHub repo. Um, so, sorry, uh, we have a rules feed for a GitHub plugin that we have for Falco. So you can see um, if you plug in to GitHub, so for the logging source that comes from GitHub, um, you can build your own rules, these default examples, but an example of like, for instance, GitHub actions that are being performed on GitHub and that if they contain a, a minor, so like we talked about XM rig or um, any of those minor examples, um, you could absolutely have something say, GitHub workflow has minor set to true and trigger as an alert so that you get a critical, for instance, alert to tell you, you know, this is happening. Um, the other way of looking at this is um, if you have the different plugins from the different sources, it's very easy to use Falco Sidekick to filter through to understand, okay, where is the, the big issue coming from? So for instance, we have our different sources. Right now, I'm only using system calls. So plugin sources include Kubernetes audit logs. So if you want to see, for instance, events for when a deployment is created, a config map created, or deployment deleted, or config map deleted, for instance, you would certainly get those events. Um, you could have a plugin for GitHub or Okta. So again, you're now going from, or uh, yeah, AWS for CloudTrail. So being able to say, here are my identity provider, like Okta. Here's my um, supply chain in form of GitHub. And here's my cloud provider in the case of AWS, being able to stream all those events, handle them through the pl flex flexible plugin architecture. It's important to then say, I can send it all to this centralized view. Again, I can forward it then over to um, automation tools for deciding what to actually do with those events um, or ship it off to, for instance, a notification tool like Slack. Um, but also from the search, I can just search for an arbitrary string. So we've been continuously talking about XM rig. So if I were to type in XM rig, even though the two doesn't inherently know what XM rig is, it's just looking at string matches. In the case of things like the minor binary that was detected, in the case of writing below the root directory, or again, escalating permissions, any of this, we will see that happen throughout, not just in the case of the minor binary. For instance, like a pod could be called anything and it could talk to these outbound connections at the minor pools and ports. But in our case, if we scroll across, we know it's happening for the, uh, yeah, it was the command that was actually wrote, uh, written in this case was XM rig, which makes sense because that was the utility we just ran. So in that case, whatever the context is, like again, the command, it could be the pod name, you, we get Kubernetes context. So um, like if you, if the pod or I don't know, it, whatever the context is, if you see that match string context, it will show up in the, the rules alert context. Um, building your own rules is really easy. There's a few different ways. Um, so um, the first way is we can actually just go into the config map like you would done here. You can click in uh, I and you can just paste in the rule list macro, whatever. As long as they match, you can then close it and then, you know, kill the pod and recreate and you get the changes. The alternative approach is if I was to go to 
Um, I believe I have it here. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just put it on screen. So I'll quit. So if you were to go to um, cd forward slash etc forward slash falco, um, is there a falco? Yeah, there should be a, oh yeah, I might have to create it. There should be a, a rules.d directory in the falco folder. And from there, oh yes, yeah, I don't know why I couldn't move to that directory, but that's okay. Uh, basically, you should be able to modify the existing like custom rules file. And from there, you can put in your own files and then Falco will update it to respect those new rules that you've created, um, which is a really nice thing to be able to do. I think it should actually, yeah, you can do it via Helm as well. So you could say Helm install Falco-F, specify the YAML file, and then say whatever the repo was, which is Falco security for slash Falco. Um, regarding creating the environment that we you know, looked at today, um, you know, I've, I've put it all into a GitHub repo. What's also important to know as well, and I think we might have put it in the chat in case um, we can confirm that, but we have like, um, we've created like Falco uh, blogs on these topics. So again, crypto mining through GitHub Actions, or if you wanted to our official blog, you can see the examples So like crypto mining detection using Falco. We go through all of this in depth so that if you want to create the same rules, if you want to understand how how the rules are built, what is the logic behind it, but most importantly, how it shows, like we showed in the demonstration today, um, the real-time alerting, you know, that that's the ideal outcome, is that you can go in here, test out Falco. Since we're talking about system calls, whether it's an IoT device, um, again, whether it's an EC2 instance running in cloud, it really, there's no limitation. Uh, anything Linux related, it's going to be perfect on. Um, and that's really exciting because it means that as you're testing these other tools, you can use Falco for intrusion detection. Um, again, a bunch of different operating systems it supports. So, you know, whether it's Ubuntu in my case, or if it's uh, CentOS or whatever, I have pods I was creating earlier that were CentOS. Um, it should work the same in each of those cases. Um, so, yeah, just to wrap up, I guess we just had a few slides on this topic. Um, and I can just share on slideshow. And again, if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to ask. Um, but the main thing is that like Falco could be used as a network intrusion. And I'll actually put on a bit of light in this room. It got very dark very quick. Um, so yeah, you can like detect outbound connections to those IPs, domains, ports. So it can be used as a network intrusion detection tool. Um, also for looking at ingress or egress traffic, again, from suspicious IPs um, or from whatever you can define what is even from logins or some other activity, you could say uh, some login change was made from a user from this uh, approved IP. And that way, anything that isn't the approved IP, you could say is not equal to, and therefore see the unusual activity. But in the case of crypto mining, it's pretty consistent. The only exception to when you wouldn't get this detection is if, for instance, they hid the, um, the mining server behind a CDN service like Cloudflare. That way, and again, in the Tesla incident, they did something like that. So their IDS tool didn't actually pick up on the connections that was made to those IPs. That's why it's important to look at all of the indicators of compromise, not solely connections made to IPs. So one thing we said as a clear guardrail for organizations was to set this uh, allowed privilege, uh, privilege escalation to false. I mean, there is so much more than you can do to that. Like you can use uh, OPA, like a uh, gatekeeper, do you know, to define what can and can't be admitted, you know, admission control in the environment. Um, that's an important tool as well to implement, but also things like your network policy enforcement. So you could use a Calico or a Cilium or your service mesh to define what connections you allow. So you can ultimately prevent the connections going into those mining pools, but that only stops the, you know, the connections for the miner, the miner still is using up your resources. So, you know, a good place to start is to look at privilege escalation. Because when we look at it in the context of the MITRE um, table, you can see, yes, privilege container is uh, a technique in the tactic privilege escalation, but where else can they move to? So things like node to cluster escalation, control plane to cloud escalation, compromised admission control. There's so many other things they can move to. And that also justifies more use case for why it's good to use the fl pluggable um, system of plugins, sorry, the flexible plugin architecture of Falco, so that you can see okay, someone's escalated to cloud. 
these are the changes made in the cloud environment. So they've escaped an EC2 instance. Uh, yeah, but sorry. Have two, no worries. We have two questions from the audience coming in right now already. So Tyler says, this is really powerful stuff. When should I be implementing Falco directly into my cloud native ecosystem as opposed to paying for a tool like Lightspin that uses Falco to do this stuff for me? Yeah, uh, you can go whatever way you want to approach this. I think uh, uh, when you're talking about when to bring it into my cloud native ecosystem, I think a good place to start is when we talked about the documentation we have, um, I'm pretty certain we have a quick start guide on this. So if I was to look up uh, quick start, um, the reason I'm pointing towards the quick start guide, um, hmm, I don't know, getting started, it must be. And then you can say running. Yeah, so that's cool. So there's different ways you can go about it. Obviously, you can just install it in your environment. There's the Falco binary. You can install it as a Docker container. Um, and then we also have like Helm charts and so on for installing it. But I think we also have the example for Minikube. You know, if you if you have a little test lab and you're running it um, in your you know your like home lab environment or running it on your desktop and you you know you're not ready to test out Falco and all its capabilities like in your production environment, this is a great place to start. You can just you know you would get the tool Minikube. It's just a little utility. Um, from that, you just run minikube star, specify the virtual box driver. And from here, it's like a few simple commands to say, look, here's the Helm repo command. So I'm pulling from that Helm chart. I'm updating it and actually installing Falco. It's like three commands. Once installed, yeah, you say, you know, logs, which is, this is just using purely Falco, by the way. This way we can say, here's the log output to prove that it's working. And, you know, you can start modifying rules accordingly. In our case, we went a little a bit further because we use extra utility called Falco Sidekick. We also have this documented as well. Um, and that's for streaming events out, but also just streaming them to this graphical UI, which I'm currently accessing it via port forwarding, which has been running for throughout the whole session. Um, but yeah, if you're talking about a place to get started, I think Minikube's the best one. Get familiar with how the rule structure works, how to modify your own rules. And from there, absolutely, then start looking at bringing it into a a staging environment. Perfect. And then there was a question uh, from IT Sploit who asks, is Falco able to do remediation or is it only alerting? And actually, Mikael already chipped in and said that Falco is only for um, threat detection tool. Yeah, that's a good point. So right now, Falco is, yeah, Dick, you can see it on our landing page. It's purely about taking all those different sources and then being able to inspect what's happening. Rules, of course, make it easier to see what the unusual activity is. And when we create some curated rules for you, and when I say some, quite a lot, so that you know you already have them in your hand. But you're right in saying it does not automatically take action to, you know, to do something. We could kind of we could use um, Cisco or sorry, uh, Falco Sidekick to hook to send webhook to the you know your third party tool that can do that automation process but that is not handled within Falco. So in here, it's purely, think of it like a, a security camera. It's If it's always on, it always sees what's happening. Perfect. Um, is there any other questions on that topic? I just want to make sure. Uh, not at the moment. Uh, there was a person saying, this is amazing. Thank you so much and so forth. So, but no questions at the moment. Awesome, no problem. So I might just go on to those last slides just to make sure. Um, you know, we have um, as much information into your hands as possible. So, you know, we talked about detecting privilege escalation. If you can avoid creating overly permissive pods, same logic lies to cloud environments where we talk about overly permissive IAM policies, the user policy of what they can and can't do. Think of the same logic to pods. You know, it's easy to create a privileged pod for testing purposes, but it, it's not good in the case of security posture. You're just putting too much um, control into an adversary's hands if they get access to your environment. The other thing is we talked about the custom rule and maybe this was confusing to some people earlier. What I showed here was this is a rule that is not in the default rules list. I created it purely for the case of crypto jacking to show how easy it is to, you know, in five to 10 minutes, you can create your own rule to, you know, detect crypto mining. Um, so in my case, I wanted to have something that would say, this exec CVE system call, which is basically, we've seen it throughout the demonstrations. If in a pod, in a host, you know, on a container, if this exec command is run, so if we see here, 
Um, we're looking for any process name that's listed in the shell binaries. The shell binaries, it was already there. Actually, this list already pre-existed. So that's just saying anything that's like bash, dash, um, sh. Those um, are defined as our process types that we're looking for. But in regards to the macros um, or the list, sorry, we created this list ourselves. So that was where we mostly we just talked about XM rig. But if you had like XM rig, I, I, or XM1R or whatever it is, nano miner, any miner, you could even have wildcard miner if you want to do it like that. So any kind of you know miner that you can think of, put it into a list. Lists aren't limited to strings in this case, like uh, like the name of a binary. Like think of it in the sense that it can be an IP address. It could be uh, a hash value, a SHA. So you could say, um, here is the known bad hashes associated with malware. Chuck those hashes into a list. And you can use the same logic to say, if a process triggered and it has this hash value that we've seen in the system calls, yeah, we can detect and prevent that as well. So in this case, it's really easy for us to say, I've defined a macro that's saying if the process name is in the malicious binaries list, the list is the list of items, and then the in malicious binaries is specified here. So if it's a spawn process, basically it's like exec CVE, which was the event type that was run. If it was listed then in that macro, which entails the list, then we would trigger an alert that says something generic like, malicious binary or script was executed in a pod or host. We don't know at this point, but in the command output, which it'll tell us either it was on a host, well, it will be a host and a pod if it's a pod running on a host. So that's a really cool one, but ultimately you can tag it whatever way. I tagged it for crypto mining because that was the whole point of today's demonstration was that you can then filter as well for tags. You know, you could tag it based on its miter attack tactic or technique. You could tag it based on the type of environment that it's triggered in that kind of thing. But ultimately, the source is based purely on system calls. So we can go really deep. There's really very little dim limitation to what we can and can't see. We talked about networking connections, um, file update changes, permission changes, all of that. And then the final piece I just want to go on here is that, again, we, we talked about the default Falco logic, where we have you know certain drivers that are in place. So we, we monitor those system events that are coming from the kernel. Um, we have, you know, our default um, Falco implementation, and then we also have an eBBF driver as well. And again, that's probably better for another session if that's something people are interested in. Um, but then we can monitor the Kubernetes audit logs. So again, we have a plugin for that. You've probably seen it in my event output that we can correlate, again, the container output via system call, but also use Kubernetes audit log to see, okay, what was the deployment? What was, you know, that was associated with that part that was created? Again, you can follow the full chain of activities, and that's really important. So any new source activity that comes from it, we enrich that data. And then finally, when we talk about that standard API that we provide, it means that we can use our same existing architecture to then understand, OK, what is the, the logging source of the other tool, like SaaS platform, whatever it be, that we're trying to plug into, and ultimately build the same consistent rule language as long as when we go back we just specify our source from syscall. We could change it to K8's audit. We could change it to AWS CloudTrail, whatever it is that we're trying to plug into, um, which is really cool. And again, if you're a developer and you're really interested in making these plugins for a tool that you provide, there is no reason why you can't contribute to the community in that sense. Um, so with that, um, I hope everyone kind of found value out of today's session. Um, we have like a developer's guide for if you're interested in building plugins. Um, I've listed the Falco rules because we've rehoused our Falco rules. So um, again, you can access those even if you're not testing it today. You can read those rules today and understand how they're built and what's the logic behind them. Um, from a kind of a educational further learning, <laughs> um, I've provided a blog for um, detecting crypto mining. Um, I wrote that last year, so it's not too old and the rules still apply today. And the other one was if you're interested in seeing how crypto jacking works in other environments, I've also given a blog article for the Falco plugin for GitHub. So that way you can detect crypto mining on a Linux host, but you can also see it in a SaaS platform like GitHub, which is really cool. And also if you want to follow us, you know, we're pretty much accessible everywhere. So we have the GitHub repo and we've linked that accordingly um, where you can follow us on Twitter. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a LinkedIn page as well, but either way, it's the same name. And I also put my own GitHub repo for today's session 
So if you want any of the commands I ran to do your own crypto mining on, and ultimately just you know to have the rules running and detect the crypto mining in your environment, feel free to use it. It's publicly available. Um, so with that, yeah, I think we've covered everything. I just want to make sure that we've um, got time for any more questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, uh, there is a few comments so far. And oh, a question came in immediately. Perfect. That's good. Uh, and keep the questions coming in. We have 15 minutes for them. So no worries. Um, for starters, there was a um, attendee commented that they've found the Sustig uh, Falco 101 um, as a great resource for getting started on Falco and linked to that one. Uh, that was really nice. And then we have Andrew commenting alternatives for Minikube just in case you are against running VM on your local machine. Check out Kubernetes without kubelet, uh, K-W-O-K. Um, and then he gives the links for that. Um, if you have any comments on that, happy to hear that. But then there was also Ashkan commenting or actually asking a question about, is there any available support such as tools or references that can make creating a Falco rule simpler? Is there any references to make creating the rules easier? Um, there should be. So when we talked about our blog or documentation, sorry, separately. Um, yeah, absolutely. If you go to the Falco rule section, and we look at like the basics of rules and how they're created and conditional syntax. You know, this is a great starting point. Like probably the most common one that everyone's going to look for when they want to test off is shell into container. So understanding like what are the event types that we're playing with, um, like specify directory, container ID, whatever it is. They show you like the examples here with wildcards, so on. Um, and also things like the priority, like this, because it didn't specify the source, it's by default looking for system calls, just like we did today. Um, so you, you, know, you can see that it says, here's the rule. It goes through the logic of the conditional set. Um, it should have the, the definition of how like, the outlook works. So again, what is the alert going to be that you find? Um, but this is a really great starting point, I think, for going through understanding the syntax so if there's ever anything that you see in a rule and you're just curious, you know, is it required? You know, otherwise it won't run uh, correctly. But also you want to say, like, what can I put into it? You get a better idea from this table. So for instance, we talked about source. It doesn't need to be specified. If you don't, it will always use system call. Actually, typically your system call and Kubernetes audit, depending on context. Um, but ultimately, if you want to use any one of our other plugins, you would then need to specify source that equals that plugin. Um, but yeah, even the logic of macros, how they're built, how all of this ties into the shelling container example, I think this is the, the best place to get started. But I think also we have, um, uh, well, it's Cystic provides it. It's like an instruct lab. So there's, I think, like, I think someone mentioned it earlier about the 101. So, you know, there's an instruct lab. So that means the whole shell is hosted somewhere else on a SaaS platform. So you actually just start the you know, the session, you don't have to put any login credentials or anything. And you start, you know, running some arbitrary commands and it actually shows them in real time. So that might be a, another alternative cool place to get started. Great. Uh, if there's any more questions, keep, please keep them coming. We still have a time for them. But for now, I have a question to ask uh, from my side. So if I'm using, for example, Opakeeper to ensure all, all images must be from approved repositories. Why do I also need to use Walk Palco as well? Yeah, this is a good question. So in the case of like, um, you approve what you can and can't put into your environment, that's fine. But let's say if it's like um, an employee that's logged into the environment. So, you know, it's an admin and they're um, an insider threat in this case. You know, it's fine to say we've set all the guardrails of what can come into the environment, but there's nothing to stop the employee who is ultimately, you know, the one who can do the most from actually running the mining binary themselves, or let's say disabling or elevating permissions to actually go and make these changes. So it's important to set guardrails, like for instance, um, defining what you can and can't permit to the environment, just like what we talked about, setting those privilege set to, you know, false. But we need the intrusion detection as well to say, if an employee, an employee if a user inside our environment is making changes that they shouldn't, we want to be able to see them, even if they're failing, like for instance, they were unable to elevate permissions due to a fixed rule. You want to say, oh, we got a detection of someone trying to do something suspicious. 
that way we can, you know, for auditing purposes, uh, you're again, you want to be compliant with your regulatory standard. You want to have something in place, in Kubernetes, to tell you, okay, we have proof, auditing proof that you know log activity is there. We can see activity, unusual activity in the environment, and we've alerted on it. So, so that's one of the main reasons. Even if they're not able to do something, if they're kind of air capped in what they're able to do, um, we still want to be able to detect unusual, suspicious user behavior. Perfect. Uh, another question that I had in mind is, so what happens if the outbound connections are going to a server hidden behind a CDN service like Cloudflare? Can you see the mining pool connections? No, and that's a really good point. You know, I think we touched on that a little bit earlier was how, you know, if, if it is behind some service like that, we'll only see the connection to the CDN, which in itself is not, you know, uh, malicious. So in our case, what we want to do is tell users, look, if it's the network connection that we can't really rely on, we want to be looking at other things. Like we created custom rules there to say, if a process is executed and it even has the string listed somewhere to do with exam rig or other mining binaries, then we should be able to. And again, we can show that inside the UI that if we just type in exam rig, yeah, we get all that relevant context. So we can see, okay, if we can't see outbound connection, we know a minor binary was detected. Maybe we can see exam rig in the context of setting permissions on it, um, or even just a folder. You can say like, um, I've seen exam rig associated with file name changes or something in those lines. So it's just one of the many indicators of compromise, but saying that is probably the most common one people cite as something to detect, which is network connections. Um, so yeah, definitely it's about having multiple uh, indicators of compromise in case you're unable to detect those connections. Great. Good to know. Um, another question from my side. So if we have a Kubernetes uh, lab running in K3S running on some IoT devices and edge computing, so can you test Falco rules there? Yeah, absolutely. So if we go in back to the, the documentation we had, so yeah. So if we were to talk about like install or getting started, um, it's important to know like, yeah, even actually it's covered here at straight. So like, you can install Falco in pretty much any environment. So whether it be, uh, you know, I don't know, you're running on a Raspberry Pi or like an IoT edge device. Um, you know, even in theory, you have a, a security camera in front of your house. If that has like an API that's accessible, yeah, you could have Falco running on that IoT device. You could create a plugin for that other API and you could essentially stream events for suspicious activity on the camera whether it turns on or off or whatever it be. So yeah, it's super flexible. Again, anything Linux based, which is, you know, it's an open standard. Um, yeah, you can build your own, you know, you can run it on all those different operating systems. So whether it be, um, I'll go into the install doc, whether it be like Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, whatever it is, we usually have the, you know, the install documentation associated with it. And of course, in the case of Kubernetes and K3S, you can use the Helm charts. So it's super easy. Great. And then final question um, from me. So also kind of final call for questions from anyone else. So if anyone's typing away, trying to get the question in, now is the time to finish the typing and send it in. But if an attacker um, installed the mining binary on the node instead of the container, can Falco also detect this? And does it require a new role? No, and that, that, that's, a, you know, that's the point here is like with these system calls, you know, if we were to... Um, go back into um, the UI here. When we looked at the, yeah, let's say uh, the condition we're looking for was the outbound connection. So we can see when we look up outbound connection and these were all our critical alerts. In some cases we ran it as a Docker IO during when we ran Docker run. Um, in some cases we ran it within a pod. Um, so we can see those, you know, the alert context, what was associated with the activity that played out was different. But whether it was on the node, whether it was in the container, or whether it was run again as a pod deployment, or you know in Kubernetes, or if it was run as a Docker run, we would still get that same context that the uh, the connection was made to the IP, irrespective. And the same with the binaries, we would always see it was XM rig used in each case. So yeah, as long as we have the context specified in our output of the rule, then you get all the context you want to see. So you might want to see node name, you might want to see container image use. Because again, in each of these cases, when we created the Docker run, uh, I think it was Docker run, no, it was when we created as in the K8 deployment, 
and there was no specific image repository accessible, but in the case of Docker.io, it was. So some context might not be there in the same way it was in another command, but ultimately, the more context you put into the output you want, then naturally you're going to catch it either way. But either way, the, the rule is going to be triggered. So when we type in outbound or whatever it is that you're looking for in the rule name, yeah, you, you will see the same for containers it would be on the node. Great. Um, and I don't see any questions anymore here, um, but do you have any final words to uh, remind anyone of any resources or anything that they should be doing next or anything else? No, um, absolutely. I think um, just to clarify, and I'll double check it there, was we have, um, we have um, I should say, an ebook that we have now accessible on the topic here. So I could put that in the chat. Um, I think it's a really useful resource. Um, so I'll just put it in the chat there. I think this chat is, no, this is the private chat. How do I put it? For, oh yeah, it's on the right side panel. And I'll share that uh, with everyone. If you put it to the private chat, then we can share yeah, it to the public that's chat. Fine. So yeah. we have this um, practical cloud native security book um, on Falco. So if anyone wants to learn like the inside out and you know you want to implement it within your company, definitely a great place to go. Um, it's a free book, you know, you don't have to pay for it or anything. Um, the other is that we released um, a project, uh, Honeybee. And again, for those who are already, you know, experienced with Falco and they want to know what the changes are um, recently with the project, um, we also have that documented. So if I was to uh, paste that as well in the chat, um, you can share that with the group. So, you know, we have the new update, a new version update of Falco, um, and we're constantly maintaining the project um, where wherever possible. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, those would be two really useful resources for anyone who's uh, interested. Perfect. Perfect ending note for this uh, really great uh, session, in my opinion. Great resources for everyone to check out afterwards. So awesome. Um, but yeah, that's it for today. And thank you, everyone, for joining the latest episode of Cloud Native Live. It was great to have a session about detecting crypto jacking in Kubernetes workloads. We really also love the interaction from the and the questions from the audience. Great to see some discussions happening there as well. And we, as always, we bring you the latest cloud native code every Wednesday. And in the coming weeks, we have more great sessions coming up. So stay tuned for those. Thanks for joining us today and see you all next week. Bye.